Hi, I'm Dan with Family White TV, and you have found the do-it-yourself subwoofer section of the Home Theater for the Masses series. This video is about the advantages of building your own subwoofer, and so if you're not willing to use power tools or aren't willing to build a subwoofer from scratch, this video is not for you. Check out my subwoofer video for information on buying a subwoofer. However, if you're up to the challenge of building your own subwoofers, this is a great place to start. I'm going to be talking about why you should build a DIY subwoofer, the three types of DIY subwoofers, the amplifiers you can use for DIY subwoofers, and what tools and resources you're going to need. So why go through all the trouble of building a DIY subwoofer? To save money? Well, yes and no. People who build do-it-yourself subwoofers do so because they are mining for extra low-frequency content. We're digging deeper than most commercially available subwoofers will take us. We're looking for usable output in frequencies below 20 Hz, and in some cases, even into single digits. Now you may be saying, what for? You can't hear below 20 Hz. Well, technically you can hear down to 12 Hz in ideal conditions, but for the sake of argument, let's say human hearing hits a brick wall and you can't hear a 19.99 Hz tone. Is there a reason to build a subwoofer that can reproduce audio below the 20 Hz barrier? Yes. While you may not be able to hear these frequencies, you can feel them. If you've ever had a helicopter fly over you at a low altitude, you could feel the thump of the blades. Or perhaps you were at a fireworks show. Or maybe you stood close to the railroad tracks while a train went by. All of these are examples of real-world situations where you could feel the sound. That sound that you can feel is infrasonic sound. Sound that is too low to be heard, but that can be felt. So, do movies have content below 20 Hz? Well, many of them do. Here are some examples of some movies with audio below that 20 Hz threshold. As you look at these spectrograms, the bright colors below the red line is audio that is below 20 Hz. Okay, so that's great, but why not buy a subwoofer that can reproduce these sounds? The answer is simply because there are very few viable commercial solutions out there, and the ones that are out there tend to be very expensive. Don't even bother with professional subwoofers. If you look at the specs, they tend to roll off at around 30 Hz, which is fine for music, but we're in search of subterranean audio reproduction. In order for infrasonic audio to be tangible, it needs to be reproduced at a high level of over 100 decibels. And so in order to reproduce this subterranean audio, you need displacement. A lot of displacement. Which also means you need a big enclosure. A very big enclosure. Or if you prefer subwoofers, you need a lot of sealed subwoofers. Now before I go on, I'm going to mention that having a system of subwoofers that can reproduce infrasonic audio is both a blessing and a curse. When you're watching a movie that has this content, you're going to have a great time. However, there are some sound engineers out there that apply a high-pass filter to a movie's low-frequency effect soundtrack, removing most of the audio below 20 Hz. And when you watch a movie that has been high-passed, you'll be let down. For example, How to Train Your Dragon is a movie that is in the library of a lot of infrasonic bass heads. This movie has some epic scenes with bass that extends really low. When Hiccup first meets Toothless and Toothless growls at him, wow. If you haven't watched this scene on an infrasonic capable system, you've missed out. And the final fight scene will shake the house. But when they made How to Train Your Dragon 2, they high-passed the soundtrack. It absolutely ruined the movie for me. Now fortunately, there is still enough content that applying an EQ boost restored some of that content, but not all movies are like that. Some movies have infrasonic content that just can't be salvaged. And when you play these movies on a system that you know for a fact can reproduce tactile bass, you can't help but feel a sense of emptiness. It's like biting into a jelly donut, but there's no jelly. 
it makes you sad. But when the content is there, it's like cracking open an egg and having two yolks inside. You win! So if you do want to do this, there are various levels of how far you can go. Now I think AVS forum member MLaw384 said it best when he pointed out that there are four different levels of bass enthusiasts with infrasonic reproduction. Level 1 is people who can't reproduce the frequencies at all. Level 2 is people who have subs where the cones actually move in the 1 to 15 hertz range, but there's no noticeable experience. Level 3 is people who have enough amps and subs that you actually experience the infrasonic frequencies. Level 4 is people who want the infrasonics of the bomb explosion in the movie to actually be felt at a level that scares the crap out of you. You actually feel the realism and think there may be structural damage. <laughs> to be honest, I'm at level 3. I want to be at level 4. Perhaps someday. But anyhow, the important thing to remember is that there is no replacement for displacement. One subwoofer is not enough. You need at least two. You see, every time you double the number of subwoofers you have, you generally increase the available output by 6 decibels. And so it will be really hard for a single subwoofer to produce 115 decibels at, say, 15 hertz. If you add a second sub, it's easier for both of them to work together to get you to 115 decibels. If you add two more subs so that you have four total, you'll easily be able to reach really loud levels. Now this is a general rule, but there are times you can gain more or less than 6 dB at certain frequencies depending on how your specific room is set up. But as an added benefit, more subs will also help even out the room's frequency response. And so now we get to the part we talk about the three main families of subwoofer designs. These are sealed, ported, and infinite baffle. All of these have variations within the family, and all of these have their pros and cons. You see, there are three things people want with a subwoofer. They want it to be small, they want it to have low extension, and they want it to have easy power requirements. The problem is you can only have two of these. And so for the first subwoofer design, you have sealed subwoofers. These are relatively small and have low extension, but you need a lot of amplifier to drive them. Two of these will get you into the teens. Four is better. The advantage of this kind of system is that it won't take up a ton of room. AVS forum member Base That Hertz has a total of 10 subwoofers. 8 18 inch drivers and 2 21 inch drivers, and they're all in sealed boxes. And as you can see, four of his subs take up less room than my two. And so, if you have a smaller room, you'll probably want to consider sealed subwoofers. The disadvantage is that these will require really powerful amplifiers in order to drive them to high levels at low frequencies. According to the 2013 build thread by Bass That Hertz, he was using about 35 kilowatts to power a system of 10 subwoofers. I'm not sure how much he has now, but I do know it's more than that. You can check out his YouTube channel, Base That Hurts, if you want to see a little bit more about what he's got. Now, another disadvantage of these is that you will have more total harmonic distortion the lower in frequency you go. However, this is generally not audible with these low frequencies played at high levels because the sound of the room vibrating and things within the room shaking is louder than the sound of the distortion. Now the next design is the design I went with, which is the Large Low Tune, or LLT, subwoofer. Large Low Tune subwoofers are ported subs that have a low tuning point. The advantage of these is they can play really low without needing a ton of power. The disadvantage is that they need to be very large. My subwoofers are tuned to 11 Hz. In order to achieve that tuning, I had to go with a 24 cubic foot enclosure. The dimensions are 2 feet by 3 feet by 4 feet. Now if you're creative, you can get four of these to work in a room. For example, in one house I lived in, I had these in the back of the theater, and I used them as a riser for a third row of seating. In my current house, they're in the front of the room behind the screen. Now there's also a design called a Sonosub, which is a design that uses large cardboard tubes. For example, ABS forum member MK Theater made some Sonosubs here. These take up a lot less floor space and look kind of cool. Now if you're interested in this form factor, you'll want to look for a product called Sonotube. This is a product normally used to form concrete columns, but they also work great as large low-tune subwoofer enclosures. 
The third and best performing option is the infinite baffle setup, like the one seen here, built by AVS Forum MK Theater. Now he built these after some earlier designs. He's, this guy's built a ton of different subwoofer designs. But technically, this is a very large sealed subwoofer. An infinite baffle subwoofer is created by mounting your drivers to a wall so that a different room, crawl space, or attic serves as the box. The advantage of this design is that it is easy to drive and goes really low. The biggest disadvantage is that if you move, you can't really take it with you. It requires modification to your house, and so it's a solution for people who don't plan to move anytime soon. So those are the three main types of DIY subs. Now if you've decided that you want to go ahead and build your own subwoofers, educate yourself on what you need before you start. You can't just take any old 18 inch driver, stick it in a box, feed it lots of power, and expect it to perform well. While all these systems work well with 18 inch drivers, there is more to a driver than its size. Speaker drivers have parameters called Thiel Small Specifications, or TS Specs for short. The specific values you will want to look for vary depending on the route you take. This video will give you an idea of what you can do, but once you decide on a specific route, go to some of the sites I'll refer to later on in order to get fully educated on what you need. Now these days it can be tricky to find a suitable home theater subwoofer driver. There's not a lot of profit in the large subwoofer driver market, so one mistake can doom an otherwise excellent subwoofer provider. As a result, a lot of legendary subwoofer drivers have come and gone. The first place to look for drivers is on DIY subwoofer forums. Do some searches and ask around to see what the best currently available drivers are. The online store Parts Express also sells raw drivers and is a good source to look at. You can also look around for manufacturers of car audio systems. They will sometimes have a few drivers in their lineups that can be appropriate for home theater applications. Next, you'll need an amplifier to power your subwoofers. Now there are a couple of good options you can go with. Most people who build their own subwoofers go with Pro Audio amplifiers. Pro Audio amplifiers have the advantage of being relatively inexpensive when compared to monoblock amplifiers made for home theater. The disadvantage is that they usually need some minor modification to work well in a home theater. Specifically, you need to change out the internal fan. The fans that come with Pro Audio amplifiers tend to be very loud and they don't go well in quiet home theater rooms and so you need to change them out with quieter fans. Now you see, for subwoofer applications, we can get away with less airflow to cool our amplifiers. This is because when driving subwoofers, these amplifiers are only called on to provide gobs of power for relatively short periods of time, whereas in a concert-type venue, the amplifiers are being driven near their limit for hours at a time. Now which specific fan you need depends on the amplifier you get. You can usually find fan modification threads from people who've done it that will tell you exactly what you need to get and how you need to install them. Now if you need a 12 volt fan, the best brand to go with is Noctua. Their fans tend to be a bit more pricey than the El Cheapo computer fans, but they are worth it. I use these fans in my home theater and in my computers and they are the gold standard of quiet. Okay, so which amplifiers do I recommend? With my two subwoofers, I'm using a single Behringer iNuke 3000 DSP, which as of the making this video sells for $280. This is a Class D amplifier, and I can testify that it gets the job done. If you need more power, Behringer also sells the iNuke 6000 DSP. Now the huge advantage of the iNuke DSP series is that it has a built-in, fully programmable parametric equalizer. If you build your own subwoofer, you will need to run the source signal through an equalizer in order to get good frequency response that works for your room. With the iNuke DSP series, and make sure you buy the amp that has DSP on the end of the model name, you have that built in. Another amplifier that I've seen people use is the Behringer EuroPower series. Now, I haven't tried this one in my setup at home, but it looks like it should work as long as you disable its low cut filter via the dip switches on the back of the amplifier. The main disadvantage of this one is that it does not have a built-in internal equalizer and so you'll have to purchase an external equalizer in order to use this amp or any other amp without an internal DSP. Now a third option you can use is to get a plate amplifier from PartsExpress.com. The advantage of these is that they are designed to mount easily to a cutout on your subwoofer box. The disadvantage is that they seem to be a bit more pricey and they don't put out nearly as much power as Pro Audio amplifiers. 
Now regarding Pro Audio amplifiers, some people may argue that they will not give you as much audio quality as something designed for home theater. Now this may or may not be true, I haven't tried it myself, but what we're doing is powering a subwoofer, and so absolute audio quality isn't nearly as critical as if we were powering full range speakers. If you do buy an amplifier that does not have built-in equalization, then you'll need to get an external equalizer. For external equalization, a lot of DIYers use a product called the Mini DSP. It costs just $95 and it gives you a six band parametric equalizer, which should be more than enough for subwoofer equalization needs. And so now we're gonna talk about some of the software and hardware tools that you're going to need in order to design and build your own subwoofer. In order to model your subwoofer before you build it, you'll need a free program called WinISD. You can use this program to model sealed, ported, and infinite baffle subwoofers. Now, in order to model an infinite baffle, follow the guide and the link provided for infinite baffle subwoofers in the description below. If you plan to build a ported subwoofer, and particularly a Sonos sub, but there is a program called Sonos Sub. This program will help you achieve your desired tuning frequency while ensuring that your port is big enough so that you don't experience chuffing, which is an undesirable audio distortion caused by too small of a port. It'll also help you make sure that your port is small enough to fit inside your box. Now for measuring your subwoofer and the rest of your theater, there is a free program called Room EQ Wizard. This is one of the gold standards in the DIY community and the program is so powerful and full featured that it's hard to believe that it's actually free. Now along with this, you're going to need a measurement microphone. A measurement microphone is a microphone that is designed to have a flat frequency response as opposed to vocal microphones that'll have boost in different areas of the frequency spectrum. The U-Mic 1 is a good one, especially if you're using a mini DSP because it works with the mini DSP. Behringer also makes the ECM-8000, which is another measurement microphone that is popular in the DIY community. Now an actual tool that you'll need that not a lot of people have is a circle jig. A circle jig is used with a plunge router in order to cut perfect circles in wood. Now I made my own, but you can also buy one on Amazon, specifically the Jasper jig. However, the Jasper jig goes up to a maximum hole size of 18 and 3 16 inches diameter. So while you will be able to make a hole big enough to fit an 18 inch driver, if you want to flush mount the driver, the Jasper jig is about a quarter inch too small. But it is large enough that you could drill a few extra holes in it yourself, and since this is DIY, why not? Now some websites you can go to for some great information. The first is the AVS Forum, where they have an excellent and very active community of DIY sub-builders who have a ton of experience and knowledge. These people will be able to answer the most technical of design questions. Another online community is Home Theater Shack, the home of Room EQ Wizard. Their forum has some great design and how-to threads in the sticky section of the DIY forum, and they even have sub-forums designed specifically to each of the main three subwoofer designs. Now, there's also a website called database.com, and it's another good subwoofer community that I do refer to from time to time. And so there it is, your primer course on do-it-yourself subwoofers. If you're up to the challenge, then go forth and cause some structural damage. Now, if you haven't checked out the rest of the videos in the Home Theater for the Masses series, here's some that you might be interested in, along with some of the other videos on my channel that you might be interested in. And I'll duck to miss this video up here so that uh, you can see that one. And I'll be a good little YouTuber, and I'll ask you to please like and subscribe if this was helpful for you. And check out some of the other videos, and thanks for watching.